I'm a student panelist and, and organizer for the Oregon Think Tank, which is a university housing initiative along with the Oregon Brain Trust. Is it um, and so we meet, the Oregon Think Tank meets every Tuesday night at 5.30 in the Collier Lounge in Hamilton, if you guys ever want to stop by and uh, put forward panel ideas. Um, so we, I would really, really like to thank uh, the Robert D. Clark Honors College uh, and University Housing both for sponsoring our events. We've been able to do panels for six years, thanks to them, so thank you for coming. Um, tonight, our panel is called the Music music and musicians in the digital age, and we're focusing on how the internet has changed the music industry thus far. Oh, there's Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. I know that we're short on time. Um, to the far left, being rigged up on mics, there's Mike Vars, you just heard him perform. He's a, a Portland MC. Uh, and I have here that you are one third of the hip hop group, The Verbal Felon. Is that still current? Yeah, we got it. Yeah. So that uh, Mike is actually coming out with his third LP this summer, which is pretty cool. And then uh, on the the screen behind us is Jamie Laurie, who's actually joining us from Denver, Colorado. Uh, Jamie is the yeah. Woo! Me too. Uh, Dem Jamie is the one of the MCs for the Denver band, the Flowbots. Uh, they released an album last year called Fight with Tools, uh, and they are. Um, very socially minded, they're looking to engage new minds and cultures. Uh, so it's really lovely of Jamie to be here long distance. Hopefully we have no technical glitches. And then we have Charlotte also in the green t-shirt. Charlotte Misser is the uh, director of, or, or the station manager of 88.1 FM KWBA, which is the campus radio station. It is an excellent, excellent production and it is a mess, I'm sure, to coordinate. Charlotte is very on top of her things. But she also is a graduate of U of O Law School. Uh, she has a JD focusing on intellectual property, is that correct? Um, and she's also working on a master's degree focusing on women in the broadcasting media, if I'm correct on that. She is very well educated. And uh, <laughs> lastly, I'm very afraid that I'm going to butcher your last name. Andre? Stan. Stan? All right. No, Food Stamp. Oh, Food Stamp. Okay. DJ Food Stamp does a really, really excellent show called Welfare Radio on KWBA. But, uh, that's, that's what you want to go by? We're good? All right. Andre. Andre. <laughs> Andre Soroy. DJ Food Stamp does a fantastic show. I don't remember the time slot that you're on. Mondays 2 to 3. Mondays 2 to 3. Plug the show. Um, but he's also a graduate teaching fellow in the journalism school at, here at the University of Oregon. Um, and he's about to do his dissertation on um, hip-hop DJ subculture. Yeah? And he's also himself a hip hop DJ and journalist, so it is both an academic and a personal pursuit of his. So we're gonna do panels. I think we're gonna try and get Jamie in first, if that's okay with you guys, because he's here on a limited time schedule. And then uh, we'll have our panelists speak in the Q and A session at the end. Thanks so much for coming. years. 
years, but we really had our, our breakthrough last year as far as sort of the national scene. Um, not something we really ever expected would happen. You know, we were just making the music that we like to make, but we, you know, we had one song that really was a hit uh, locally, and that attracted the attention of people nationally. And so it's, it's enabled us to do things we really never thought we'd get to do. Um, you know, tour all over the U.S. We went to Europe, we went to the U.K. And uh, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, but I think more importantly, for most of us in the band, the, the real, the reason that we do music um, is because we believe that it's it's as powerful a tool as anything else in terms of social change. And um, you know, we try to at every at every turn integrate that into the, the the work that we do, integrate that into our careers. Um, and as our career has shifted, we had to think in different ways, and that's where we really started to, to utilize the. But I come at this discussion from a very different place, I think, than than someone who's who's primarily looking at how to make a living as an artist. Um, you know, we we uh, you know we 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 formed a nonprofit organization that does that, that's designed to translate the enthusiasm people might feel for a show into social activism, and so. You know, we've used the internet in that way, and our music has been a, a platform from which to do that. But I, I wouldn't say that we've spent, I haven't personally spent a lot of time thinking about copyright law, thinking about, you know, where I stand in that realm, I guess, because I see all the music as an element of, of social activism. And so I'm, I'm looking forward tonight to hearing from other, other panelists and really helping to formulate, um, you know, more of a, more of a, a direction on that, because I think it really is it's more complex than it might seem, I guess. Maybe I can just leave it there and then hear from some other folks so we can get into some dialogue. Yeah, definitely. Copyright, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of that, and then talk about how it is um, practically applied within the radio side of things, which is a very different perspective than the artist side of things. Um, so, just a, a a brief kind of here's what intellectual property is, and here's what copyright is. Both of them are really um, legal constructs. They're they're legal definitions that have been created to um, apply a a legal process, procedure, and consequence to this act of sharing and use of content. Um, and so being that that's the case, then it's actually, these definitions are actually both subject to the politics, um, well, th they're more subject to the social conditions from which they evolve than they are to any sort of politics and law and, and other sort of factors that are included there. So in, in terms of intellectual property, what we're looking at is really the expression of creations that come from the human mind. And it's really been defined as um, something more specific based on the US Constitution. Um, the Congress has said that um, they have the power to quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And what they're doing in that, what Congress is doing, is really ensuring that artists do have this exclusive right, that they sort of have a monopoly for this limited period of time. Creators essentially get credit for their work. It's really nice for the authors and the artists in that fact. Um, in terms of copyright, copyright initially began out of the English side of things. It came from England to the US. Um, in the US, it wasn't until 1978 that music, video, sound recordings were actually recognized as copyrightable material. Copyright does not protect ideas and processes, systems, methods, concepts, or principles. What it does protect is things that are fixed in a tangible medium. So, you know, the, the content that's actually on a CD, that audio recording that you've made on a cassette tape, that MP3 that you've just downloaded on your computer, that is copyrighted material. Um, 
The biggest challenge to copyright at this point in time is the fact that it is so incredibly out of date. Copyright laws were written in most cases 1978 or before. That means they're what? I'm, I'm not real good at math. So 30 years old? 31? Yeah. That, that's pretty old for something that's been evolving as much as it has. You think about how, how much of the internet actually existed in 1978. Not a whole lot of it. So the amount of change that's occurred with the digital music side of things has, has been pretty substantial in that period of time. And so what we're looking at then in terms of change is the Digital Millennial Copyright Act of 1998 has come about and really been a way for the recording industry to say, let's put some stopping, <laughs> let's, let's slow this train down and put some rules on how content is used in a digital world. Um, it wasn't just the US idea, there, there was some um, you know, foreign interest in all of that that I won't really go into. Uh, but generally, the Digital Millennial Copyright Act, the DMCA as it's also known, was, was supported by the entertainment industry, industry and software industries, um, opposed by scientists, academics, librarians, consumers, and civil rights groups. When I think about that, it kind of makes sense. You know, we're looking at, again, the Constitution is saying that um, we, we want to promote progress give artists this ability to invent and protect their work, but the librarians, the academics, the consumers, the scientists, they're saying, wait, we don't like the Digital Millennial Copyright Act. So we're kind of at this imbalance between what's actually going on sort of from the recording industry and what, I guess, the artists and the people who are actually seeking the protection, there, there's an impasse there. Um, so the biggest concern really, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the radio side of things now. The biggest concern there is, again, the, the same idea with this substantial change as things have, well, sort of revolutionized with digital content in the last few years. We don't get hard copy CDs and vinyl in nearly the quantity that we used to at the radio station. We used to get, you know, hundreds of CDs and records sent to us every week by music promoters, by independent artists. We still get those, just not nearly in the quantity that we used to. It's now coming to us as an MP3 in email. That's great, it's just not quite the same. So for a radio station, we really have to work on putting ourselves in a position where we can now handle a different kind of content that's coming to us. In addition, there's the recording industry saying, we want to further regulate what broadcast stations are doing with this content. There's an argument that for a radio station to take a CD that comes in and to burn that onto a hard drive, you know, rip the CD, there, there's, there's an argument coming from the recording industry saying, that's illegal. Well, how is the radio station supposed to play it if all they have is a computer in the studio? Many radio stations out there don't have CD players or turntables. All they have are computers. So we get into this weird position then again where the recording industry is saying one thing and then the artists, in this case the radio DJs, are trying to do something else and it doesn't really mesh. Um, the, the last point I'd like to make, I guess, about the broadcast side of things is the new licensing fees that seem to be coming up over and over and over again. Um, KWVA does an online webcast of its programming 24 hours a day. So anywhere in the world you can, you can listen to it. And that's pretty common for most radio stations at this point in time. But the recording industry has been encouraging and asking Congress to adopt more specific regulations that that govern the royalties that are paid. So in previous years, stations would pay just a flat rate. Here's, you know, here's the amount of money that we pay to do our online streaming for the year. The recording industry wants radio stations to pay per listener, per song, for everything that's played on the air. So if you play 10 songs in an hour and you have 10 listeners, 
you're paying for a hundred, I guess, a hundred um, actual, I, I'm not sure what they call it at this point, but, but that means that suddenly not, not only do you have just, you know, 10 songs in an hour that you've played, but you're quadrupling that or, or exponentially increasing it because the recording industry has set it up in such a way that they want to seek as much of the profit from that as they can. And now there's also legislation before Congress right now that's asking broadcasters to pay, it, it's a new um, royalty fee that broadcasters would pay that's very similar to what they're doing with webcasting. Broadcasters are already paying fees which are going to the artists. And so we get stuck as broadcasters in this position. Great, we wanna pay the artists for the music, but there's been this long-standing history where um, radio is sort of this, this beneficial environment for artists. It's a mutually beneficial environment um, because the artists and the radio stations are both benefiting. The artists are getting their content out there, the radio stations are getting the content to play, and now the recording industry, speaking on behalf of the artists, is asking for money for the items that they're giving radio stations to play. So it gets, it gets tricky and definitely the radio stations, may I speak, I guess I can only speak for the radio station I'm at, we want to play artists. We, we want to en encourage people to listen to new artists. We play as much as we possibly can. But it gets to be hard when we start having to pay fees for every album that's coming in, for every person that's listening. Um, it gets to be challenging. And for many radio stations, it's just not financially possible. Um, so I think that's all I want to say for now. Um, yeah. Pass the baton. Yeah. What up, Jamie? What up, dog? Yeah. Chilling, man. Oh, wow. um, cool. All right, so. Um, I also, like Charlotte, come at it and do the academic uh, nerdy stuff. Um, I also do the practical stuff. So I've been a fan of hip hop music since about 1984, believe it or not. Uh, I was about five years old then. Um, I've been a fan of sample based music my whole life. Uh, I make music from other people's music. I think it's productive. I think it's a good way to be creative. Um, and uh, I think there's a big difference between that sort of sampling and the Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Diddy, whatever the hell you want to call him, uh, sort of looping uh, sting music um, and singing over it poorly or writing crappy rhymes. Anyway, um, so um, to say that the music industry and copyright is a mess is an understatement. I think uh, shit show is the appropriate terminology. Um, and I think up until now, copyright has never really been an issue. Um, it's always been an issue, but it's been one of those issues that's gotten brushed under the rug until uh, Napster came around, a peer-to-peer, -peer, and then uh, the Grey album uh, came around in 2005, and then it's become a part of common discourse. And uh, at universities, uh, especially recently, everybody asks, well, did you get permission? Um, did you ask? Do you have to pay for that? D who owns the copyright? This was never a question maybe even 10 years ago. Um, but now we're, now we're worried and copyright regulates us and it reg regulates all of our uses of copywritten material in both an active and passive way. So in the active way is that um, the recording industry goes after your peers, 17 of your peers from this university and sues them for their life savings. Um, in a passive way, copyright law at regulates us um, that we're so afraid of the active regulation that we don't infringe on copyrights. Uh, uh, some of us say, fuck it, and we just download music or make beats, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think copyright law is important uh, to an extent. I think that authors should be protected. I think it's different when we're talking about uh, the difference between an artist and a corporate artist. Um, and um, really, copyright is all about corporate artists. Um, but we've come to a culture where it's a paper thought, paper, uh, paper use permission uh, culture controlled by uh, the uh, media or content industry. And just to give you an idea of how valuable copyrights are to uh, average record labels, they account for about, um, in terms of when we're talking about reissues and back catalogs, we're talking about 40% of their revenues and about 70% of their profits for a typical major record label. So they have a lot um, invested in uh, protecting those rights. 
Um, so I just want to go through a little brief, little brief history of music and copyright, their sort of co-evolution, um, and, and sort of this analysis about how copyright is not about us, it's about uh, these uh, wealthy uh, corporations, and then talk about something called access. Um, and just to let you know, I'm an advocate of creative commons and uh, free culture, uh, which is more of a collaborative approach to owning uh, intellectual properties rather than uh, proprietary and closed. So um, recorded music and its history is bound by, um, bound by intellectual property laws. Uh, recorded music and intellectual property laws are bound by technology. If we don't have technology, we don't have recorded music or we don't have intellectual property laws. Uh, recorded music, intellectual property, and technology are all a byproduct and are bound by uh, this thing we call capitalism. Um, and they uh, help to reproduce that. So anyways, without technology, recorded music doesn't exist. Uh, intellectual properties don't exist, right? And without intellectual properties, uh, recorded music is just a thing. It's just a record. It's a piece of plastic. It's just cardboard. Um, and it's limited by the technology. So if you scratch a CD or you scratch a record, it, it no longer plays. The commodity, the, the, the plastic, is, is you just throw it in the trash. But what lives on, what's valuable, what lives on, is the intellectual property, the copyright uh, of, of that material, the music. So um, anyways, um, Technology then has both enabled new musical forms and new ways of profiting, but it's also uh, tearing this music industry uh, apart simultaneously. And um, from the phonograph all the way to the CD, uh, uh, playback technologies, music formats were developed by the music industry. Um, MP3 comes along and uh, iPods and computers, and that wasn't developed by uh, Sony or EMI. That was developed by um, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Um, so for the first time in the history of recorded music, um, uh, hardwares and softwares are being developed outside of the control of the industry, and the music industry does not like not having control. Um, so it's important to remember that copyright laws reflect the needs and wants of businesses and lawyers and not of culture. It's a way that uh, these people can essentially own uh, bits of culture, and this term in, in the context of this discussion is music, uh, and that's for about 95 years, which is a limited monopoly, um, supposedly. So any music that's created in our lifetime, unless we live to be 96 years old, there's effectively a monopoly on that music, which is copyright law supposed to limit that. Um, and it's important to remember that uh, we don't own the music CDs and records that we buy. We don't own we only own the plastic, right? Um, we're paying an extended rental fee. Um, we own the object as property. The sound written into the grooves or the uh, binary code or whatever encoded into the music CD, uh, we don't own that. That belongs to someone else. So all the music industry really has at this point is copyrights. That's my stance. And they exploit those in a marketplace. Um, really quickly, copyright laws always been trying to keep up with technology, and it did a pretty good job in the early 20th century. It's done a really shitty job uh, in the, the 20th century especially, but the latter half of the, uh, uh, excuse me, the 21st century and the latter half of the 20, 20th century. Um, I'm gonna skip through some, some things, but you know, copyright uh, protected musical compositions and then the public performance of those compositions back in the day, right? And then this talking, machi uh, talking machine uh, business comes around and starts recording things. Um, and the talking machine business starts using compositions made, made by publishers uh, in their recordings. And the publishers, which at the time was Tin Pan Alley, says, geez, I, this isn't cool. You're using our, our compositions and you're, you're making money off of this. And so they were pitted up against each other, right? And they eventually copyright law made the talking machine business pay a royalty uh, to the publishers. Then Radio comes along, and radio starts using recordings from the talking machine business uh, as basically free or cheap content um, to fill airwaves. And the talking machine business didn't like this. They said, geez, you're using our stuff. We want some money for it. You assholes, give us money. Um, so we, then we have the talking machine business versus the radio business. Well, Charlotte said they all, they've all come to terms, right? And it promotes music and radio. Well, this doesn't even matter almost anymore. Because the same people that own the radio stations own the record labels. And the same people that own the record labels now own 
the publishers, and that's about five, five or six entities in general. We're talking major, the bulk of everything. And in terms of owning any valuable copyrights, you know, Mike Bars, he's got some copyrights, right? He went, he banged them out in front of us, right? He he owns those rhymes. That's that's his his stuff, right? And and he probably you make some dough, man, right? You sling some CDs, you do some shows, a little bit of money, right? But he's not raking in mad dough. So his copyrights have a certain amount of value to him, right? And so we as people, we have our copyrights, but in the marketplace, they're not worth millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? Maybe right. someday, yeah. right? Keep hustling, man. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, to get it back on, on my, my little uh, diatribe, um, along comes this thing called the cassette. And uh, I don't know if any of us remember that format, um, <laughs> but it was once here. And um, this is the first time that music is circulated outside of the control of the music industry, right? Outside of its own market. It, again, lost its control. Um, and they did not like this. And the cassette really represents the first format of consumer power, right? We didn't have to listen to an album track after track after track. We could make essentially our own mixes of different albums. We could listen to songs in different ways, right? It enabled us. And we could also borrow music from friends and make copies. Um, the industry, like I said, does not like to lose its control. And it controls the market through copyrights, at least in my uh, perspective. So, uh, like Charlotte said, there was a limited time granted to copyright holders. It was initially 14 years, renewable for 14 years, then it goes to 28 year term, uh, renewable for 14 more years, then it goes to 28 years, renewable for another 28 years. By 1976, it's life of the author plus 50 years, or for a corporation, 75 years. 1998, comes around, Mickey Mouse is five years away from going into the public domain, meaning I could make Mickey Mouse t-shirts and sell them on the street and make money off of it, and Walt Disney would have to row in his frozen ass grave um, and just deal with it. So anyways, Disney and the Gershwin estate and Dr. Seuss and let's see, who else? I don't know, uh, Robert Frost, his estate, they paid a lot of money to Congress. And Congress goes, all right, well, we'll tack on another 20 years. Um, so now copyright law essentially protects any expression of an idea for uh, 95 years for corporations who hold the, the, valuable, the valuable copyrights. And for Mike, uh, life, his life plus 70 years after. So his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren can capitalize off of anything he makes. Pretty sweet, right? Setting a good life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so... What does the industry do after the tape? It loses all this money from piracy. It introduces the CD. The CD would sort of uh, curtail copyright infringement, right? Because we didn't have CD burners. And, and uh, you know, um, what happens is that in the 1990s, the CD burners come out and blank CDs. And we find out we can make CDs for like a dollar, <laughs> 50 cents. But whereas in 1983, CDs cost $18 and probably $15 to manufacture, in 1998, they cost $18 at the, at the Tower Records or the Circuit City and about 25 cents to make, right? The price never went down. Um, so they, they basically screwed us for 20 some odd years, 15, 20 years. Um, and so what the industry does is instead of once the MP3 really co becomes popular, instead of going with it and developing their own digital distribution models, they, they decide they're going to fight it and they're going to sue us. They're going to sue their consumer base. Um, pretty much a big mistake. They really screwed themselves instead of adapting their 100-year-old business model. OK, OK. Last thing. OK, um, as Charlotte said, copyright law protects expression of ideas in things, fixed into a medium, essentially, um, not ideas, right? And as we move into a, a, a more digitally or oriented world, if we're not already there, um, the digital world is more of a world of ideas than it is uh, a world of, of things, uh, very much. So the current problem exists between three parties. The first party, in terms of music, are the major record labels, or any record labels. Um, the other party are the, I don't know, the, uh, the digital technology people, the computer people, the Googles, the uh, Microsofts, um, those people. And the last party where, you know, uh, where this problem exists is with us, the consumers, the, the people, the culture, 
whatever you want to call us, society. Um, so anyways, the techno people want the free information, right? The record labels want the proprietary information. Um, and I'd say that we also want free information, right? And information, music could be information, right? Um, I guess. Uh, I guess if it's written in code, it's information. Um, but we want free information for a reason unlike Google, a reason unlike Microsoft, right? We want access to our own culture. We want access to culture, essentially. Um, we don't want to sell ads, and we don't want content to exploit in a marketplace, necessarily. We just want access. So lastly, um, the music industry creates an artificial scarcity of their music using copyrights. And the solution, at least the solution uh, as the way I see it, is access. Um, and this is access to a means. In digital technology, uh, computers and the internet gives us access. If we have access of, to those technologies, that's a whole other issue. But barring we're on, we're on a college campus, we all have access to the web, and we could probably find a computer. Um, if not, let's talk afterwards. I'd, I'd like to find out more about that. Um, but access is a form of democracy. Um, and when we say democracy, it's not in terms of uh, voting people into office or sort of democratic process. I'm talking, again, democracy is access. It's access to a means. And with digital stuff, digital technologies, we have uh, access to the means of production, right? Production? Yeah. You're on YouTube? Yeah, a little Dis bit, a little bit. <laughs> distribution, too, right? We never had this 20 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and access can be profitable. Uh, at points, it will get to be profitable. Um, and I'll use a case in point. In 1918, the patents on the gramophone and the phonograph ran out um, and in flooded the market with hundreds of record labels that could um, use those patents to make um, recording their own recording technologies. And then we have things, music being recorded that wasn't classical music, that wasn't marching music, right? Uh, jazz and the blues, all right? So there was a flood of independence because they now had access to means. Um, another good case in point is the 1970s, uh, an era plagued by cassette piracy, right? Where cassette piracy tore the music industry apart, yet simultaneously in those 10 years, the industry grew by 400%. So access to music all right, or access to content or culture or whatever you want to say um, is profitable and it's good for us and it's good for music. So free music or cheap music may be killing the music industry. Um, I don't know. But in the 10 years that piracy has plagued uh, Sony and EMI and all these Warner Brothers and Universal, um, the sale of musical instru instruments has doubled or quadrupled, something rather ridiculous in the last 10 years, and concert sales have gone up through the roof. So while recorded music is not doing so well in terms of profitability, music as a whole is doing all right. So um, I'm going to just end with this, because uh, I've been babbling on. Um, and I tried to make notes so I wouldn't babble on, but it's, uh, it's really hard. Um, in the end, we have these record labels, these multinational companies, right? They still have 95 years of, of protection over their, over their content. Um, and they will continue uh, as major labels, as corporations, to exploit musicians, songwriters, um, um, and then obviously us, uh, or try to ex exploit us and, and get, our mon uh, get money from us. Um, and really, in the end, all they have is a legal agreement, copyright. It's a legal agreement. That's what the music business has. So 95 years doesn't sound like a monopoly, but who knows? Mickey Mouse is going to be emancipated from copyright protection in 2023. Um, who knows how much longer uh, copyright protection is going to last in terms of duration, uh, how much money Walt and his homies are going to put into the pockets of uh, congressmen. Um, and how many more decades these people will be able to exploit their content. So in the end, we are the ones who pay, okay, both financially and creatively, and creativity, uh, 
creatively, okay, in terms of, again, access, right? We need change in this clunky, archaic system. Um, and I think she said it, I've said it probably redundantly. Um, law has not kept up with technology. And uh, we should support collaborative sharing systems like the Creative Commons, right? Free culture, movements like that where we share stuff and we b become better. Because that's what copyright's supposed to be. It's an incentive for creation, all right? And proprietary ownership of culture doesn't necessarily, necessarily create an incentive for anybody else to do anything except for to be passive consumer dupes. Anyways, I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, dog. I saw you nodding off. <laughs> Me, um, I didn't really. I'm a little out of place. I didn't really come prepared to, you know, talk about copyright laws or anything like that. I'm just. <laughs> there you go. See, we're on the same team. I'm just a musician. I came. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I came to talk about myself, right? But um, you know, I can. I definitely got some things to say when it comes to copyright laws and getting on the radio and all this stuff. Um, so first off, I wanna. I wanna ask, honestly, how many of you guys heard of me before you came here tonight? How many of you guys? Raise your hands. Okay, you don't count. You, you got to put your hand down. <laughs> Anybody? No? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so first, I want to say you, Flowbots guy, you need to get me famous. You need to help me with copyright laws. You need to get me on the radio. That's how we can make things happen. <laughs> then we can all be on the same team. Okay, now let me get into, let me get into relevant <laughs> stuff. I just, you know, I saw a little spotlight of shine on me. I had to take it. Okay, anyway. Um, Basically, you know, when it comes to, to copyright laws um, and stuff like that, I'm, I'm really lost. You know, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. I have, you know, all the, all the tunes you just heard, you know, as far as I know when it comes to copyright laws, somebody could really just rip that off and I got nothing. I mean, do I have anything? You know, I haven't, I haven't like mailed any of my CDs in anywhere, you know, government stuff. I don't know. You know, I don't know anything about that. Um, I'm just an ignorant musician, you know, just doing what I love, making music, you know, <laughs> hoping I get somewhere eventually, putting in money. I've learned one horrible thing, which is, you know, it takes money to make money, which is unfortunate, you know, for a lot of us. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm working on it, working on getting places, doing big things. Um, you know, I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to get radio play, but as I, I, I discovered, and he actually mentioned this, was that, you know, all the radio stations, or most of the radio stations, because, you know, you, you do some stuff on the radio, so you got some control, but a lot of the big radio stations are, you know, monitored by record companies and things like that, so it's like, how am I supposed to get on there, you know? I mean, Flowbots do, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know your, your name, Jamie, Jamie? Yeah, you, I mean, hey, you, you got some, like, you got the big hit, you know, so like, you can, you can help me out. I don't know, I don't know anything about that. How did you get there, man? How did you do it? I'm trying to find out. I mean, I'm asking you a question. I'm putting the spotlight on you now. <laughs> Right. Um, and it was all those things. It was all those things going. Hey, you know, some little formula went off, some little light went off, and all those different radio offices, and they all decided to call on the same day. But, um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's making me think sort of of like sort of copyright history. I, mean, I, I remember being in the Living Station in 1998 and like mailing to myself, and I think I still have one. <laughs> Obviously, it's making a big difference. It would probably affect the way you know music is being made in the city, but 
personally, I, that's never been what I've been in for, and so I, I, I have felt some pain, I guess, <laughs> to use better language than this. Um, I think of people like Dennis Redman in 98, I saw them, they were on Loud Records, you know, and I went up to them, don't you know how to make a label? They said, yeah, yeah, just wait, you know, wait, wait, and I was like, you know, this is the world we live in, the word out there. I, I've always seen this about finding opportunities and using that for some, for some greater good. Um, we, we had this clear kind of, clear channel station in Denver last year. There is a possibility to find some new good corporate sponsors, and I guess that's that's the limitation of my being in the scene of like <laughs> <laughs> the limitation to kind of where, where my thoughts are around this. Just how can we how can we use this as the activist movement uh, wherever we are, whether, whether we're at the Santa Cruz show where we have a little the one song or video of the one here, you know? How do we use that to then mobilize people so we're fighting these these very real corporate issues? I mean, you know, Monsanto. And Yeah, for sure. Is that I'm what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, vaguely we, we s- talking, strayed you know, off a little. No, but then <laughs> <laughs> I gave you spotlight, man. I gave it to you. I wanted to hear it. But um, yeah, you know, I'm like I, I experienced a little backwards activism, if you could put it that way. Um, I, the the director of my video for Switch It Up, you know, the political song I did um, that really is not relevant anymore. Um, uh, basically, you know, how, how that came about was she called me up because she liked my stuff. She had heard it. I don't know how or where, but she had heard it. And um, she calls me up and she says, okay, look, you know, I'm a director. You're a rapper. Let's use our powers together and unite and become supersonic or whatever. I don't know. Um, but, you know, she, she was basically trying to find some kind of a scheme to get us both out there. And one of the things was, you know, talking about something relevant like politics, like Barack Obama. And she was like, okay, I'm going to ask you one question. Are you, you know, how are you politically? Like, what, what party are you? You know, who are you going to vote for? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm not trying to offend you because I don't know, you know, what your perspective is. But I'm going for Barack Obama, you know. And she was like, okay, thank God. That's what I was looking for because, you know, I'm really wondering, I think you're a fabulous MC. I'm wondering if you can, you know, write a song about that and we can put that out there right before election time and, you know, get that down. That got us, you know, 5,000 hits on YouTube, but what is that compared to, you know, 50,000 or 100,000? You can't get anything played anymore unless you put it under somebody else's name. And the one time I tried to do that, you know, the, the record company messaged me and was like, copyright infringement, die, bro. You know, it was... <laughs> It was not fun, um, you know. So I had to take that down after I got, you know, twenty thousand views on that. I was like, "Oh my God, it's awesome!" You know, and then they delete it right off the bat. So, you know, starting from ground zero. Um, next closest thing I've had, you know, I, I have one video that I managed to keep up there—a little copyright infringement, maybe. But I'm doing a, I'm doing a cover of like some Twister song or something like that. You know, showing off my fast spitting skills and. Um, you know, a lot of people have actually hit that up and given me good reviews. I had one guy say the other day, um, look, you're, you're uh, really good, but before I start giving you compliments, I just want to say you're white. You can never do this. You know, and he was, he was a black guy, and he was saying, you know, you, you can never rap. Just, like, put the mic down, go home, go to sleep, take some pills. I don't know. <laughs> don't rap. But you are good, though. I was like, oh, Okay. Um, all right, I'm not really going to listen to that, you know, and then I had another guy comment him back saying, um, you know, call, this was a white guy, and he starts calling him the N-word, you stupid racist N-word, and, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, buddy, you know, I didn't agree with this guy either, but now you're just going in the opposite direction, he's like, he's great, blah, 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 so then, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I need to cuss both of these guys out, you know, because <laughs> this is not working, but the white, the white racist guy messages me, 
and is like, hey, I got some guys that want to give you a record deal. And I'm like, oh, no. What the hell am I going to do? You know, because I don't want to affiliate with this this racist dude who's, you know, saying the N-word and all this stuff. But he's, he's offering me a record deal. You know, I'm like, ah. Oh. So I still haven't messaged him back. You know, I'm probably going to end up cussing him out, you know, losing opportunities. But that's probably what I should be doing. But, you know, I have no idea. Like, really, you know, as, as we talked about, nobody's, you know, hurting me. I, that doesn't hurt my feelings. That's what I was expecting. You know, I'm not... I'm just a dude, you know, still living at home, just making music. Um, when it comes to samples and stuff like that, you were talking about how you're really interested in samples, and, you know, um, we were talking about some of the copyright laws. I'm scared shitless of all that, you know. So, I no, yeah, definitely. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's people going to jail and paying $20,000 and, you know, doing all this stuff. So my, you know, the, w the way I do it is I make sure, okay, I'm like, I got GarageBand. I'm going to make all original music. So, like, I try not to use any samples. I really did some research on GarageBand because they provide some loops that you can use. And I like to keep my stuff, you know, more original. But I definitely understand the art of sampling. You know, I think it's really cool. But, I, you know, I don't know enough about the copyright laws and stuff like that to be able to actually pursue making music based on samples. And, you know, I can't sell it because I'm trying to sell all my, all my songs on iTunes. I'm thinking, okay, what can I actually sell and make money off of? What can go somewhere? I did one song where I sampled a Marvin Gaye song, and I'm not putting that on anything because it's like I don't know how to get the rights to it, you know? So I'm... Yeah, you pay a million dollars, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Eric Sermon paid over a million dollars. Oh, man. For that Marvin Gaye sample. How much did I pay? No, but you did. Oh, Music Soul Child is great. Great dude. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah, that's. I'm not pursuing that song. You know, it's one of those songs that's, you know, it's like the underground song, even though I'm already really underground. So how is it? What is that, double underground? I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's songs like that. You know, it was a good song. People have told me that that's one of my best songs. Um, it was sampling that uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. It said... Uh, you know, there, there's that part in the beginning. He's like, "Listen, baby," and then I changed it, and I like, I I hired the sample, so it's in one of those chipmunk voices. And then I I sang over it, and I added a G before the listen. So I said, "I glisten, baby," and I made the whole song about jewels and bling. It was tight. But um, anyway, you know, and as you can see, um, I don't have money for that because I'm not famous. So you know, I was pointing to my my raggy clothes earlier. It's not that bad, but you know, um. But yeah, basically, I'm just, you know, all I really have to say, I can't relate to, you know, what you guys are talking about too much, but I definitely, you know, have run into some copyright infringement stuff over, the, you know, over like the years. And, um, you know, when it, when it comes to Flowbot stuff, you know, show me, show me how you did it, man, still, because, you know, I'm lost. I'm, you know, none of these people in the room knew about me. I think I actually heard of you guys before, you know? So I was like, all right, this is cool. I get to do a show where somebody from the Flowbots is talking. I like that. That's that's the best I've gotten, you know. But um, yeah, basically that's it. If you guys have any questions for me, you know. Sure. <laughs> I know. I was thinking about that. Um, well, for, um, I don't know, many, many, many centuries, um, music was shared. Like, we, no one owned it. It was vernacular. It was folk, you know, what people call folk culture or whatever. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was just collective memory. And then once music became a thing, it had a certain right attached to it. Now, I don't believe that copyright's a bad thing. Um, I think that it should have a limited time in a marketplace. I think 14 years is plenty of time to make money off of a commercial, off of a commercial record. And then, I mean, I shouldn't be able to take it and then sell the record. But 
people like Mike should be able to flip a, Mar flip a Marvin Gaye sample 30 years later into something entirely new, not just, just taking a song and, and putting it on. So I'm more a an advocate of, of creative sampling and creative uses. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you think you want to hear the ridiculous of copyright, I mean, Happy Birthday to You is owned by Warner Brothers. Why is that ridiculous? I mean, that's, you don't think, I, th I think that's I ridiculous think that, that if I want to, if I want to sing Happy Birthday to You um, in, a res in, in, a, in a commercial restaurant, I have to sing Buena Fest, you know, I can't sing Happy Birthday because, because, because I'm, pro I'm making profit from selling food and I can't sing Happy Birthday or in a film you have to clear the rights to it. I just, I think that, I, I think that copyright is good. You, you should have some sort of protection. I just think that it's, it's overly protecting people. Um, we as, as artists have to let go of these things that we've done and allow someone else to use that as a creative piece. Um, you know, he wants to make his, his copy of this Marvin Gaye song. Why is it that he can't do that? Never in his lifetime will he be able to do that or the lifetime of his children or his grandchildren, maybe even his great-grandchildren. But why is he entitled to it in the first place? He's, he can do that in his own style. Mm -hmm. The, the Constitution, in a way, says that you know, we have this right to be able to be protected in the work that we own, but then that we have a right to, um, to, to use that work later on as well. So those two rights are sort of conflicting when we end up with a situation like 70, well, life plus 70 years of protection. What if I want the formula for that's a trade secret. It's different. A comment too. When we're talking about this, like, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I do some of my own art, not necessarily music, because I'm not. That's not my area. Um, but I do a lot of film, and I do um, like stencil paintings and stuff like that. And I don't know. I, I've had an issue with with the I idea thing and the intellectual property stuff. Like, you know, you had uh, given the example um, of stealing, you know, food or a shirt, you know, you're stealing something, something tangible. I mean, that'd be like saying, you know, Warner Brothers owns the copyright to the color red, and you can never use the color red ever again and mix it up to form more art. So it, it's kind of like, you know, you have music and you have these ideas. It's something that's not tangible that you can't take, but you can use them to create more art. And isn't that how all art is? I mean, the, the progression of music, has, is that how it all started? I mean, how much hip hop borrows from jazz and borrows from soul and all these things where you're, you're taking riffs or you're taking you know, note arrangements and something like that and you're changing it yourself to make something entirely new. So it's kind of like, where do you draw the line at who had the first idea? You know, I don't know, I, I think to have all these harsh copyright infringements, it, it's stopping an art form, it's stopping the evolution of expression and of thought, and I, mean, I, I think that it's entirely different than, than stealing you know, something that is fixed, and as, as Charlotte said, um, with, with the copyright infringements, like something that's fixed or static, um, I don't think music is, music's fluid, and uh, as you said, Andrea, with you know, CDs, you're, you're just buying the means, you have the piece of plastic, you don't actually have the music. And I don't think anybody actually has the music except the artists. And if they want to share that um, with the world, um, I think that that's part of it, is contributing to this, this thing in art and culture. How did um, Warner Brothers get the rights to that? Did they come up with it? Oh, did someone yeah. who's working? Yeah, um, actually, the Hill Sisters in the 1860s um, uh, made an adaption of a song called Good Morning to You and turned it into Happy Birthday to You and wrote it into a children's book. At some point, um, some publisher bought that, the, the rights to that book to publish it, and then at some point, Warner Brothers got their hands on that. So Warner Brothers, I think the, the difference and some of the differences is Warner Brothers didn't create shit. 
they did not create a damn thing. At, at one point, they did. At, at, at one point, you know, they created it. Um, but they didn't have any involvement in the creation of Happy Birthday to you. They funded capital at, you know, for, for records they're putting out now, they're funding, they're giving capital and funding. But, you know, when we're talking about music and a lot of companies, they're not, they're not creative people. They're not Mike Bars and they're not, they're not, they're not Jamie. They're a bunch of suits. They're a bunch of investors and stockholders and they're not creating anything. There's people like him uh, myself, Charlotte, you guys that are making stuff, and then we're, we're giving those rights away, and then we get pennies um, in return at some point, maybe. But, you know, Warner Brothers did not write that, uh, write that unfortunately. is um, I heard back in December that the Recording Industry Association had decided to stop suing individuals and instead had um, selected to focus more on the ISPs and working with them to um, get people to dis desist doing the peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, do you guys feel that that's helping with the progression or do you feel like it's still, um, what, what more do you feel like the the RIAA should be should be doing now that it's stopped suing peop, you know personal people. I guess that that's difficult because I don't I don't believe the RIAA is really an organization that is there for <laughs> musicians. It is so. a construct of the recording industry, the Recording Industry Association of America, and that's who they're protecting and that's who they're focusing on. So when it comes to like this legislation now that's in Congress that is that, that wants to impose an annual fee on broadcasters for playing content, um, and then the fees that web radio stations have to pay to sound exchange for broadcasting, that money isn't actually going to the artists. More often than not, it's going into this pot that's held by sound exchange. And yes, technically they are distributing some of that funding to artists, but They've been sitting on millions of dollars for several years now. If artists don't come forward to claim that money, or if there's less than $5 for an artist, they're not going to pay the artist. So there's all of these things going on. There's, there's lawsuits going on saying, oh, you're infringing upon the copyright here. But the goal isn't to protect the artist. The goal is to protect the financial interest of the recording association the recording industry. And they should make their money. But at some point, they're making too much money. Or they're not sharing the wealth. Or th there's other problems there that it just seems a little unfair as to what they're doing and how things are happening. It, so not quite the answer, I guess, you were probably looking for. But um, it, it's the recording industry is a difficult organization, I guess. And I don't. I don't know that there's anyone that would say, "Oh, yeah, they're doing the right thing." Except for them. Yeah. Except for them. Right. Yeah. It, it's important to remember too that copyright is only, as it's written into our constitution, is only an incentive, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be an incentive to create. It's supposed mm -hmm. to stimulate creativity, um, um, and that's what it's really supposed. It doesn't say anything about copies. There's nothing in our in, in the copyright clause that says anything about copies. And again, the recording in, uh, RIAA is a corporation. It is has a CEO, and and it's 
it's, uh, it's essentially board members are 16 people that are CEOs of every major record label. And, uh, and, and coincidentally, um, the reason why they stopped suing their customers is because the, the, board, uh, the board members from the recording labels were not happy with how the other board members, strictly from the RIAA, were going after and pursuing their consumer base. And so there's a lot of strife. Like I said, it's it, the music industry is a shit show at this point, and that no one's happy. In a way, they're just doing whatever they can to tread water, with the hope that they will be able to maintain some sort of financial basis to get through until technology changes again, and hopefully, technology will change for their benefit as opposed to their detriment. two-sided two question. Um, kind of, I, I guess I hadn't thought about this thus far, but I was kind of thinking about the, the interplay between like radio and musicians and the, the recording labels. And with the new legislation uh, aimed at forcing radio stations to pay m additional fees on top of all of the other fees they pay just to play music, which is most radio stations' purposes, um, it kind of, I mean, Clearly, it kind of is going to, to penalize the independent stations like KWBA who aren't you know, funded by conglomerate corporations who probably have the bank to, to pay that. Um, but similarly, you know, when I think about downloading music, I feel like there's kind of an inverse thing there where independent labels actually might benefit a lot more from you know, internet downloads or, or leaking albums because it's easier for them to distribute their music versus companies that press, you know, hundreds of thousands of albums and sell them in, you know, tower records or whatnot. So I'm kind of interested to see where you guys think this new legislation might push radio stations. And furthermore, um, I'd like to see where Jamie kind of falls in the line. Like, I, I think Flowbots are signed to Universal, I think. Is that correct? So I'd, I'd kind of be interested to see in your jump in the last year or so from being an independent musician in Denver, you know, being plugged by 93.3 FM to being, you know, touring internationally and being plugged by, you know, your, your large corporation backing you. Like, have you had pressure to, you know, come out against downloading music? Or I, I guess I'd be interested to see if it's ever been brought up to you. And furthermore, like, how you feel about the, the interplay between the radio and how that might affect it. Yo, check the mic, check the mic, check the mic, check the mic, check the mic. Yo, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, the answer to your question is no, there's never, I've never had a conversation with the label. Um, the, the, I wanted to jump around because you asked multiple things. The, the, uh, I'm learning a lot here today, and actually, I, you know, I, I'm really out of the loop. I'm focused on writing an album right now, so I don't, when this new legislation, I would love to know more about. If anybody out there wants to go on our website, fightthecool.org, and post something about it, you can find a lot of music bands that would be interested in knowing, and a lot of local Denver bands that would want to know. So that's just kind of a side plug. That's our activism site, fightthecool.org. And this is exactly the type of thing we hope to kind of mobilize people around. So, um, so I do remember hearing about this, but I've been out of the loop. But the bigger question about file sharing, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of people looking for sort of some sort of like answer or policy or absolute way to. Um, to come at this, and I really feel like all, all of this is about which systems you want to buy into and what your goals are. I mean, um, you know, it, you know, for myself, like, we're, I've been hired to be a to be a musician all the time. I'm glad that I'm able to do that. That relies upon the ability to sell some CDs. It also relies upon touring and other things. Uh, I hope I can keep doing that. Um, if our next album comes out and everyone downloads it, and I have to do something else, then that's really a big bonus. Um, I do think that there's, I've skipped over, you know, the flow I've skipped over a phase that I think a lot of people stay in for a long time, which is where, you, where it really does make a difference. Every single last album makes a difference in what you can put your gauge on right now. Um, you know, 
us, it makes a different kind of difference over whether we're seen as, whether political bands are seen as, as successful ones. I mean, I think Handlebars being on the radio helped. I, I like to think that there's some voices in the industry who said, oh yeah, now we gotta go get anti-war songs on the radio. Now we gotta go get bands that have some content. Oh, now we have to have bands that have some kind of a, kind of a, an activism component to them. So I would love to think that that's the effect that it has. When it comes down to it, that's not where I'm, you know, just as I wasn't looking to Barack Obama to solve our problems, I'm not looking to record labels as the source of all things good and cultural in the world. Um, it, so it's about the goals. I mean, my goal is grassroots activists, and I mean, this is a useful platform for which to, to promote that. Um, if your goal is about making sure that the independent artist is vibrant and strong, then make sure you're not downloading his Grouch album, you know, and buy his album, go to his show. Um, it's about what system you want to buy into. If you believe musicians should stay in one city, never travel, and, and just be content to be happy making their music, I can support that too. That, you know, that, that'd be a different kind of world. But it, you know, so it's, it's all about thinking through the systems, and I'm grateful to be on this panel, because obviously the people to the left of this talking box, which is me, um, have, have given this a lot of thought, and I've, I've learned a lot here. Can I ask you a question real quick, if you don't mind? Yeah, but James? only if you face the computer towards you. <laughs> Yo, can I ask you a question? No, I'll just step right in front. Yo, man, if you don't, if you don't mind me asking, do you, um, do you have what kind of contract do you have with Universal? You got like a regular, like, um, do they front you, um, Mad Do, or do you got one of those multiple rights 360 contracts? If you don't mind me asking. No, what I mean, what I mean is, 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 is yeah, no, 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 no. What I mean is, uh, do they, whereas before a recording artist would get uh, money up front and then they would um, earn back against the royalties, and now record labels are, are signing a lot of independent acts that they're trying to, um, trying to develop to uh, 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 contracts where they get money from your tours. Or when you come out with a Flowbot sneaker line, they get some Skrilla from that. Or, or you know. Yeah, the 360 thing is shady. I mean, the 360 thing is shady, right? They're just like, all right, so this industry is dying, so we're going to try to get our hands in every pocket that exists. And obviously, we, I mean, <laughs> that wasn't something we were, we were going to jump into. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the, the, the industry is looking at for ways to get money out of it. And uh, you got to make these decisions. What are your actions? What are your goals? Um, you know, we have, we're not gonna start, we're not gonna have anyone telling us where to tour, we're not gonna have anyone tell us what to say, yeah. or what our music should like, those are things we made clear from the beginning. We had our album out already, was an advantage that we had, so that we haven't, we've never experienced what it's even like to, to be making an album while we're on a major label. We're starting to make a new album now, and I, you know, we'll see if that, if that's a good process or a bad process, but I think they, we, we've been, Stubborn enough with them that they kind of get a sense like, oh yeah, these guys, uh, these guys want some, you know, they want they want control over their their art. So does that makes I'm not I'm, I'm not I won't let me try to dodge the question a little bit. I mean I I'm not gonna, <laughs> I don't actually know where you live well, I'm not gonna just throw it out just because I don't feel like that's yeah 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 yeah. You know, so, but but uh, I'm not trying to dodge the essence of the question, which is you know how badly did they screw you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, A, I hope they didn't screw us, but B, that's kind of not what I'm in for anyways. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, like, here's the thing. I'm happy just like anybody would. When I see that there's YouTube, the first time I saw YouTube clips of somebody playing an acoustic version of Handlebars, which, by the way, they did a pretty good job. I mean, if you're an artist, that's what you care about, right? Like, oh, look, people are singing my song. And, you know, as far as I know, none of these people who've done YouTube clips have, have ever had anything come down on them. And if they did, honestly, I would, I would, I would probably trying to find ways to get you that and keep that from happening. Um, you know, so, but I think if you're an artist, first and foremost, you care about getting your heart out there, right? Yeah. yeah. I have a question for JB that's uh, a little bit off the, the track, but uh, your song Ann Brayton on the, the album, 
is about Ann Braden, who's a civil rights leader from the, the 50s and 60s and recently passed away. And I was just, I love that song. I've used it uh, to actually work with uh, college students and have conversations about social, social justice. And so I was curious about the, the process that went into making that song, like, you know, the, just briefly, um, you know, because it, it, it wasn't something that you would hear on a lot of albums. Was it something to what? You, you would hear on a lot of albums. Right. Well, first of all, I think you owe, my mind calculations, you owe us $750 per class. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's yeah. serious. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, that song was, was uh, written during a church service uh, a little while before we even were making the album. And uh, there's a group in Denver called Veterans of Hope, um, run by a guy named Vincent Harding, who you know, he was a major advisor to King. He wrote some of his speeches, including the speech against the war in Vietnam. But he has an organization that does oral history projects with folks from the Southern Freedom Movement and also the, the Chicano Freedom Movement and other movements. And she was one of those people. She was one of the very few white Southerners that really did stand up and at great risk say, you know, this is wrong, what's happening, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my life on the line for it. And so, you know, I was moved by that interview um, and wrote the, wrote the song for a church service and then ended up deciding that would be something that would, would go well on the album. Um, and actually, I, we performed at the church service about a week before she passed away. And actually, her granddaughter lives in Denver and contacted us later, and that was, that was pretty moving. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> oh, that's rough. Basically, that's that mean. The iPod is 20,000 songs, and then it's, it's ridiculous that, that anybody can actually fill that up. I mean, I mean if, if you if you just want to count that one song, it's one dollar that fills the iPod. So that's really you know, the part that is that's the iPod. I mean, that's twenty thousand dollars, and I'm, it's highly unlikely that any person out there is going to pay twenty thousand dollars for pop music. I mean, they're not going to pay. Can I answer that real quick? Um, I think from all accounts that I've seen is that the, I mean, the recording industry is sort of um, decided that they're going to start combating free with free. Um, where there's things like you buy a phone and the phone comes with 5,000 songs on it. Um, or things of, of, of that nature. So they're going to find out how to profit in different ways than CD sales. Um, obviously, privacy of their music will, will always be a problem. I think they've kind of, at this point, um, come to terms with that. But I mean, really, what's going to happen? Who knows? I mean, who, who really knows? But um, I think it's important to remember that we are allowed to have 
one digital copy of anything analog that we own. Um, so if you own a book, you're allowed to have a digital copy of it. If you own a DVD, you're allowed to have another digital, ba a backup copy of it. And um, yeah? <laughs> uh, they, were, they were telling a teacher who wanted to show clips for, to a class. Um, they wanted to the, the, get these DVDs and you know, copy the video tapes and whatnot. And I don't remember the, the company, but we saw, I saw the report. And the company said, no, 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 you don't need video clips. Just set up your, your TV and put your camera in front of it and then record that way. That's, that's totally fine. Do that. <laughs> Whoa. Well, as far as I know, there was a court case in 1984, a Supreme Court case, the Betamax tape, tape case that essentially allowed us, uh, you know, initially the, the film industry fought VHS until they figured out they could make a lot of money off of it. But the court ruled that you can, you can time shift, but you can also have backup copies. So I'm not sure what the teaching and the filming thing, but the theory is, is like I said, if you scratch a record, you should be able to have a, a, a perfect backup copy of that record somewhere, right? In, in, in theory, in, in theory. But I, I don't know about this new thing. I, I don't know. Hope, I hope I don't have to go home and, and take my 8,000 uh, piece record collection and videotape it on the turntable <laughs> so that I can have a copy of it. That would really suck. What are you gonna do with the videotape? That yeah, I don't know. So there, there are definitely exceptions to all of the copyright stuff. Um, the, this backup thing is an exception to some extent. There are exceptions for educational uses where you can use something in an educational environment as a, you know, conversation piece. You can use it as a, um, you know, a reading that you're then going to discuss. Um, they allow some of that. And then there's also this idea of fair use, but fair use is such a broad thing. And then, of course, the educational component is, is one of the fair use exceptions. Um, and that um, creates this sort of exception to the ex exclusive right based on a balancing test and some various components as to whether you know, it's actually a fair use or not. And, and it's always hard to tell whether something's fair use because it's yeah, I want to I want to use this for a academic or a, you know, social purpose, but that doesn't mean you can now broadcast the, the video live in a in a room without paying the rights for it. You still have to pay rights for it or the music too. Uh, there was there was the MDA. Oh, okay, okay. Basically, what I, the further thing I was going to say is if record companies, with, with this kind of stuff that just came up with what you're saying about, like, you know, having to film it, I mean, I don't know if, if anybody else is having the same reaction that I'm having, but I feel, find that's pretty ridiculous. And um, furthermore, if, I mean, if, if I think that the, the, what's going on, this is my theory on it at least, is that the record companies are just simply pissing off the consumers. I mean, it's making the point where you have to be so worried to do anything that people just inevitably just choose to go along with their freedom path, they feel, and they say, screw it, and they're going to steal the music regardless. So if record companies stop worrying so much about making every last little dollar and every penny out of it, and if they start actually being fair to the consumer and actually saying, okay, let's work with the consumer, let's make them a, regular, a, a reasonable price, they might actually start making more money. I mean, I, I guarantee. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an economist yet or anything, but yet or even if I'm just a freshman here. But I'm, I'm going to hypothesize and say that if they sold the track for even ten cents a piece, 
that would make people a lot less likely to steal stuff. I mean, all the things that can go wrong with stealing stuff is uh, would outweigh just paying 10 cents. But the dollar factor, that's a lot of money, and, and, and people think about it. I mean, if you want to buy five songs, that's $5. That's your meal for the evening for a college student. It's kind of ridiculous that they just, instead of paying 50 cents and listening to this song, it's really not that big a deal. I mean, people don't over, I mean, if per, for personal use, it doesn't really matter. If I'm listening to my iPod, it does not matter to me, and I think it doesn't, shouldn't matter to them if I paid a dollar for it and I listened to it five times, whereas if I listened to it a million times. It really doesn't matter. It's still, the track is on the iPod. It's there. It's my personal use. Now, it's a different story if I'm, if I'm going out there and blasting it to thousands and thousands of people, but would you also get in the idea that it's a better idea to just go very cheap and just put it out there and make it more available instead of restricting it and then expecting people to, to make a, pro expecting a profit out of it? I don't know the specifics of it, but um, from what I've, what I've read, I don't know. I'll just say what I know, what I think I know, um, that the major record labels basically said they'll make everything free in China via Google download. And because everyone's just pirates everything anyway there. So the companies don't make any money in China. So in a sense, what they'll do is they'll make money through advertising, through the through Google do downloading. So I think that's kind of interesting, you know. I mean, I, I, they're just going to give everything for free because that's the way it is already. Therefore... They're going to make money on the advertising through Google, you know, through people looking at the page to get the music. So it's kind of, that's kind of an interesting thing that's happening. Magazine model where you can get the, like some record labels will offer the whole catalog for free download and sell ads. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, think about it. Record label sells you five songs for five bucks and they give you nothing. You don't have anything. You have a bunch of ones and zeros. And if your computer crashes and your hard drive goes, then you have literally nothing. You have absolutely nothing. So I mean, really, they should really be happy about digital technology because they don't have to manufacture and produce stuff. They just give you some binary code, and then you're on your way. And thanks for the dollar, loser. You know? <laughs> Woo! I've actually seen them uh, sort of getting more into um, you know, advertising, like what you were saying, like compromising with the consumer. Um, you know, on MySpace, what they're doing now with every single artist, every single major artist that comes out is they'll promote their entire album by displaying, you know, every track that's about to come up on their upcoming album on MySpace. So you can just go on there and, you know, like your new favorite artist and listen to their entire album beginning to end. And, um, you know, like, I think that that's, you know, a lot of people are like, what? Why, why would they do that? How are they going to make money off of that? But I think, you know, as far as compromising with the consumer, that's probably a good idea because, you know, it's like, you know, you, you feel like you're not getting ripped off and you can you get a chance to listen to their entire album. Is it good? Do I like it? You know, is this is this cool? And then you, you go out and buy it because you're, you're enthusiastic about the album. And I've, I've actually, you know, I've fallen into that trap, bought a bunch of stuff that I... I got to listen to all the way through on iTunes because it's almost like reverse trickery. You feel like you, you feel like you, you're, they're <laughs> not tricking you because they're going to such an extreme. But you know, I, I think that's a smart tactic. I mean, you know, they're doing something right there. I don't know.